Thank you, Eileen. It's always great coming to Illinois because I get the best introductions. Uh, probably the best introduction I ever got in my life was when I spoke to a foreign affairs group in Chicago, uh, and the leader of it uh, stood up and looked very solemnly at the audience and said, the man from Washington is here, and he brings help. <laughs> and I was baffled, and everyone in the audience was baffled, and then he said, I just heard that in a movie once, and I always wanted to say it. So, uh, uh, But that, that was a pretty good introduction as well. Uh, my book, Land of Promise, uh, grew to some degree out of um, my research into Lincoln's uh, views of political economy uh, in the earlier book, What Lincoln Believed. And so what I'll try to do is kind of weave uh, themes together with, with a particular emphasis on uh, Lincoln, uh, although I have a much uh, broader canvas uh, in Land of Promise. So I begin with a eccentric right-wing Austrian financier who became a professor at Harvard, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, who is now regarded by many as one of the greatest uh, economists of uh, the 20th century. And Schumpeter <coughs> asked a question which, uh, curiously enough, most uh, economists have paid little attention to, uh, and that is, why are we living in a technological society in, instead of uh, in an, uh, the agricultural civilization that we had a few hundred years ago, uh, conventional economics just assumes that you have markets and you have firms and you have all this stuff. And Schumpeter's question is, you know, why do we have automobiles instead of horses? Uh, and, and, you know, why do we have, uh, in his day, uh, electricity w uh, was, was just beginning to transform everything. He flourished in the 20s and 30s and 1940s. Uh, uh, he came up with the phrase creative destruction, which has been adopted widely uh, in political discourse in a sense opposite to what he meant. What he meant by creative destruction was not ordinary market forces where some businesses form and others and go out of business and others succeed. What he, he meant was the uh, replacement of entire technologies, what he called techno-economic paradigms by new ones. Uh, so landlines are replaced by cell phones. Uh, uh, electricity replaces steam power. Uh, that's what he meant by creative destruction. Uh, and uh, he also called it uh, a term I use, industrial mutation, if I may use that biological term, that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, inc incessantly creating a new one. This, essential, this process of creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. Uh, now, what does this have to do with Lincoln? Uh, what I uh, try to do in Land of Promise is to uh, weave together subjects that are often kept separate. One is the study of political cycles, political revolutions, uh, both in the world and in our country, uh, and also what he's calling creative destruction, industrial mutation in the economy. Is there a link uh, between these two? And I argue that there, there is, uh, that historically, uh, in the United States anyway, uh, you've tended to have uh, technologically driven economic change revolutionizes first the, the economy, the business sector, then it transforms uh, a social life. Political and legal institutions tend to lag behind by a generation or two until there's some crisis. Often it's a, a war uh, or, or uh, with civ often with elements of civil war like the American Revolution, the Civil War proper, uh, the New Deal in World War II, bo both war and uh, uh, domestic reform. Uh, and then you get uh, very hastily uh, a kind of as assembling of a new system adopted to what has already been around for a couple of decades, this newly emergent technological uh, economic system. Uh, and this sounds very abstract, but uh, I hope I'll convince you that uh, it, it, it provides a useful organizing principle uh, to what otherwise is the the sometimes tedious study of American economic history, I don't know about you, but you know, for me this, this was mind-numbingly boring in school. You just had the cotton gin was invented by Eli Whitney and then a bunch of people got in wagons and went west and then people are jumping out of windows after the Wall Street crashes and so, uh, so, so I try to organize it in terms of three industrial revolutions uh, based on steam power, uh, the, the first industrial revolution of, of the early 19th century. Uh, the second revolution, which I call the motor age, based on the electric motor and the internal combustion engine uh, 
which are both uh, perfected and, and become important in the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, and then finally, the uh, information technology revolution, which nowadays we tend to think was something that happened in the 80s and 90s with Bill Gates and, and uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, in my view, we're in the early stages of it. It's continuing uh, uh, to ramify throughout the economy and, and to transform the economy and society. And we're well, we're going to see uh, coming transformations, as, as I can uh, discuss later, uh, as the in, in industrial, uh, the third industrial revolution of information technology uh, proceeds. So these are the three industrial revolutions. Uh, my use of the term three American republics is not entirely original. It's been used by Yale's uh, Bruce Ackerman and by the political scientist uh, Theodore Lowy and others, not necessarily in my sense. But the idea is that even though we pretend we're living under the same constitution that was hammered out in the summer of 1787 in, in Philadelphia <coughs> as amended, uh, that we've had this unbroken political continuity since the late 18th century, in fact, we have had de facto, if not de jure, revolutions. And, and the Civil War Reconstruction period was one. Uh, as Bruce Ackerman argues, the New Deal was essentially a third American revolution. Uh, and if you go by that theory, we're living in the Third Republic of the United States. We're, we're just pretending we're still living in the, the uh, 1787 regime. But in fact, that's a couple of American republics ago. Uh, now, we Americans, like, like our British forebearers, uh, culturally and politically, prize continuity. So even when we have revolutions, we pretend that they're just restoring what was already existed and, and we're going back to something old. Uh, the French are much more honest. Uh, they are now in their fifth republic, uh, which was, uh, it goes back to the late 1950s. Uh, they've had five republics, several empires, a directory, a consulate, maybe I'm overlooking something, uh, since their, their revolution in 1789. Uh, just to illustrate the difference between the Anglo-American and the French approach to constitutionalism, there's an old joke about an American who goes to a Paris bookseller and asks for a, co a copy of the latest French constitution. And the bookseller says with great disdain, we do not deal in periodical literature. So these are the three republics. And uh, the question is, how do these three republics interact with uh, the, uh, 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 the three successive waves of industrial mutation, to use Schumpeter's term, uh, industrial revolution. To complicate the matter a bit further and set the stage, I argue that in addition to these three uh, major waves of structural change in the United States, we've had two major traditions. They are not right-wing and left-wing in the modern sense. Uh, but, but they are deeply rooted traditions that go on over many generations. Uh, and, you know, Keynesians versus Hayekians, you know, this is kind of a shallow tradition. It exists among intellectuals and economists and so on. Hamiltonianism and Jeffersonianism are deeply rooted in the United States uh, and, and go back to the very founding of the country and arguably in different incarnations uh, have continued to exist uh, to this day. Uh, the, the phrase opposed in death as in life was uh, Jefferson's explanation of why at Monticello uh, he put a bust of his arch enemy Alexander Hamilton right opposite his own uh, in, the, in the entry to his house. Uh, they, they were intellectual rivals. They were political enemies. Uh, their uh, intellectual and political descendants have continued to battle it out into the, the 21st century. Uh, as I say, the difference between Hamiltonianism and Jeffersonianism it's not between right and left. It's not between market and, and government. What I argue in Land of Promise is that it's different views of a capitalist society or of a market society. The Hamiltonian view, which as I will, will argue later was uh, uh, shared by uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, and his first, the Whig party to which Lincoln belonged and then later the Republican party uh, of Lincoln, uh, not necessarily the Republican party of today. Uh, was a, an American version of what scholars call developmental capitalism, of a kind that you find, in, there's a strain of it in Britain, you find it in continental Europe, you find it in modern East Asia. The idea of developmental capitalism is that business and government are not enemies. It's not an adversarial view. where And, and the, perp the government is not an umpire. The government is a coach. Uh, and businesses and labor are, are players. And the nation state is a team, and the project is economic and industrial development. 
and the government uh, naturally has a guiding role. It doesn't have a stifling role. This is not socialism. It's, it's a version of capitalism. Uh, and and you, uh, the government wants to promote private property, private enterprise, flourishing markets. Uh, but it does so in a very activist way uh, or a very corrupt way. If, if you're uh, you know, from the rival tradition, which is the Jeffersonian uh, producerist tradition, and the Jeffersonians were not libertarians in the modern sense, and, and they're not laissez-faire. They don't believe in markets over everything. Jeffersonians, a uh, category in which I would include not only Jefferson himself, but Andrew Jackson, uh, and uh, uh, his great successor, William Jennings Bryan, and, and people in the 20th century, uh, both rep some Republicans, uh, but it's mostly a Democratic Southern and Western tradition, uh, with figures like uh, the Texas Congressman Wright Patman. The Jeffersonians did not believe in free markets. They wanted to rig markets just as much as the Hamiltonians did. But the Hamiltonians wanted to rig markets to promote infrastructure, industry, high technology. Uh, and they had no problem with large-scale institutions. In, in fact, if big business, big banking were more efficient, then more power to them from the Hamiltonian perspective. The Jeffersonian vision, which is ultimately a political vision, it's not an economic one, uh, uh, w was based on their conviction that you could only have a democratic republic in a society of small, self-reliant producers. That is a society where everyone worked as a wage earner for a few big companies or a few big bureaucratic government, you know, somehow would be undemocratic. Uh, and so therefore the Jeffersonian project was to distribute property as widely as possible among smallholders, not just small farmers, uh, but also small grocers, small bankers, uh, uh, small uh, uh, retailers. And to that end, uh, Jeffersonians favored interventions by government in the market, not just to create a level playing field, but to rig markets in favor of small producers. Uh, so for example, they favored the Homestead Act, uh, which was essentially giving away federal land to small farmers. Uh, in the late 19th century, they were the great champions of antitrust uh, breaking up big businesses uh, to the benefit of, of smaller companies. In the 20th century, it's sometimes forgotten now that the modern anti-Walmart campaign uh, had a predecessor in uh, the, the, very the, the very passionate campaign against chain stores like A&P in the early 20th century. And, and many states tried to abolish chain stores by uh, imposing taxes on them, by outlawing chains to protect mom and pop uh, businesses within their borders. Uh, banking, and, and we can get in, into this uh, later, there was a, a question uh, uh, before the event about banking panics. Uh, the Jeffersonians traditionally uh, favored America's rather unique and in my view somewhat crazy system of unit banks. A unit bank is a one office bank. It has no branches. Uh, it, and, and many small towns used to have them. They've pretty much dis disappeared now. Uh, but uh, up until the the 1970s and 1980s in many states, supported to some degree by federal law, it was illegal for a bank, I don't know what the situation was in Illinois, but for a, let's say hypothetically a bank in Springfield to have a branch in Chicago. Uh, and then there were laws against inter, interstate branch banking between Illinois and Indiana. All of this was pure protectionism of small bankers, but it, it wasn't you know just special interest politics, it did ultimately uh, it was rooted in this Jeffersonian vision. That is, uh, uh, you want a, a uh, local communities where they have local bankers, local grocers, uh, and so on. So those are some of the philosophical issues uh, and, and the debates we have to this day about big government, break up the banks, uh, aid to high technology industries, a lot of them uh, are, are, would have been very similar to, to Hamilton and Jefferson as well as to their 19th century uh, successors such as uh, Abraham Lincoln. Now Henry Clay, we're getting closer and closer to Lincoln, uh, so be patient. Uh, you know, arguably the dominant figure of American politics in the, f the first half of the uh, uh, 19th century was the great successor of Alexander Hamilton. Uh, even though he was a southern slave-owning planter, he belonged to the southern uh, planter class, which for the most part was Jeffersonian. and. Uh, Clay broke with his own class. He sided with the small farmers and with the industrial capitalists of the Midwest and the Northeast, uh, essentially for patriotic reasons. And you have to remember that uh, in the 19th century, the United States 
was a developing country. It, it was kind of like a, a Latin American country now, like Brazil or something. It was trying to catch up economically with what was then the world's uh, only industrial superpower, Great Britain. Uh, when the colonies broke away from Britain, the, uh, it was after uh, two centuries in which Britain, by law, had monopolized manufacturing. It was actually illegal to manufacture most goods within the United States. So for example, in the colonial period, uh, you could trap beavers and skin them and send their pelts to England to be made into beaver hats. And then you had to buy the beaver, the colonists had to buy the beaver hats at an enormous markup, right? Because the value added in manufacturing is much greater than the value added in skinning a beaver. So they, had to, they were forced legally by law to buy their beaver hats from Britain. Uh, it was against the law to make nails was against the law to, to, to make uh, uh, you know, most forms of uh, metallurgy uh, in the colonies. Uh, and so the purpose of the colonies economically for the mother country uh, <coughs> was to have this captive audience of consumers who would be confined forever to commodity exports. You know, they, they would grow corn, grow tobacco, they would ship the commodities to Britain uh, uh, Britain would then assemble the raw materials into uh, uh, manufactured goods uh, and then sell them back at a premium to the colonists. And the British did the same thing in Ireland. They did the same thing in India. This was the economic rationale uh, for colonialism. Uh, it was not free trade. Uh, the, this was a, was a system called mercantilism. It was economic imperialism. The British did not adopt free trade until well into the 19th century after uh, the, uh, they had uh, become the leading industrial power. So. The American colonies, when they broke away from Great Britain, were kind of in the situation of the Central Asian stands or republics of the Soviet Union after the Soviet Union disintegrated. Because under the Soviet Union, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, they were all assigned one role, usually kind of low in the economic chain as part of this great Soviet economy. Now that they're independent countries, they're still uh, their, their economies are mere fragments of the former imperial Soviet system. And the United States was the same way. It was a country, essentially a rural country without industries, uh, uh, whose major market, uh, even after uh, American independence, was the United Kingdom. And that was also the major source of capital and the major source of uh, manufactured goods. So two schools quickly arose uh, in the uh, new American Republic, uh, one led by uh, Alexander Hamilton and then later by Henry Clay, said, we want to be Britain's rival. Uh, we do not want to continue in the same economic relations with Britain as, as we did as colonies. So we don't want to be a nominally independent economic colony of Britain, continuing to sell them commodities and importing uh, manufactured goods. We want to be a great manufacturing power and also great military power in our own right, because you can't be a great military power without having your own uh, 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 world-class industrial base as the Confederates uh, learned to their chagrin during the Civil War. So that was the economic nationalist school of Hamilton and, and of Clay. Uh, and here I quote Clay, uh, Britain is herself the most striking illustration of the power of machinery. Uh, in the creation of wealth, therefore, the power of Great Britain compared to the United States is as 11 to 1. And he's talking about steam-powered machinery at, at that point, uh, uh, because this was the, the revolution of the steam engine. Uh, but he says, but there is a remedy, and that remedy consists in adopting a genuine American system. Well, I'll come back to that. His American system, uh, which has been emulated by countries including uh, Germany later in the 19th century, uh, uh, a lot of Latin American countries, uh, developing countries in Asia, such as uh, South Korea and Taiwan in China, in different versions, was fairly straightforward. Uh, it's a combination of uh, internal improvements, uh, by which we nowadays call infrastructure. Uh, that is, if you're going to turn a poor rural backward economy uh, into uh, a world-class industrial nation state, you have to have good ports, good harbors, and whatever the high-tech uh, transportation and communications uh, uh, system of the day is. Uh, in the 19th century, it was first canals, then it was railroads uh, and telegraphs, later on telephones and highways. Now it's the internet, uh, satellite communications, uh, high-speed connections and, and broadband, but the basic idea is that this lowers the cost of transportation and of communications uh, and allows you, your businesses to expand and your economy to grow. So there's internal improvements for infrastructure. Uh, there's industry, 
and there's a, a system of finance that supports your economic development. Uh, for Clay, and as for Hamilton, uh, in an agrarian country that was trying to industrialize, uh, they were generally in favor of, of markets and, and they were economic, you know, went along with classical economics in most respects, but they said, well, look, uh, if you're an ag agricultural country and you're trying to catch up with a more advanced industrial society like Britain, uh, you need to protect your own infant industries for a period of time. It's kind of like training wheels until they're big enough uh, in order to compete on their own, and, that, and then you can remove the protection. So infant industry protectionism was seen as a temporary stage uh, while you, you develop your own industries. Uh, the reason you have to protect them uh, and this is the logic that's been followed in Japan and China and Germany and South Korea and so on, uh, is that you learn by doing. So if you start off trying to get into the steel industry or the automobile industry in, the, in modern times, uh, your local, so let's say, Brazilian or Indian cars just are not going to be as good uh, as the Japanese imports. Uh, and so if you want to have an automobile industry, if you want to have a shipping industry, then uh, you, you have to protect your producers until they, they develop. Uh, now, this is a tax on the consumers of your country. Your consumers are being forced to buy, in some cases, shoddy goods of their own fellow nationals at a higher price than they could afford imports. But since these people are nationalists, they don't care. That's fine. It's just a tax. You know? uh, and you can do it through subsidies as well. Uh, Hamilton, for example, preferred government subsidies to industry on the theory that the taxes that paid for the subsidies fell on the entire population, uh, whereas tariffs that is taxes on imports, fell specifically on the consumers of those items. Uh, for political reasons, it's easier. Most countries, including the United States, that wanted to promote their industries have found that subsidies are much harder to pass and, and much more unpopular than uh, tariffs, uh, which are disguised. They're disguised taxes. So uh, uh, many of the, the countries that have become great industrial nations in the last 200 years, uh, including uh, uh, all four of the leading uh, industrial economies of the year 2012, the United States, China, Japan, and Germany, during their developmental stage, they relied heavily on tariffs and other barriers uh, to imports uh, to develop their own uh, infant industries. And the final part is a national, uh, some kind of rational and often centralized system of finance, uh, which it, uh, not only makes credit available uh, to entrepreneurs, particularly in this manufacturing sector that you're trying to promote, but also avoids uh, constant uh, uh, bankruptcies and, and uh, bank panics uh, and, and provides some stability, usually in the form of a central bank uh, that governs the uh, uh, economic system and acts as a lender of last resort and intervenes in emergencies to stabilize finance. So, so that's the, the American system uh, is the term. Uh, it wasn't Hamilton's term. It, it was uh, Clay's term. Uh, well, when Cl Lincoln was asked, as he frequently was, uh, to explain his views uh, he, on, on, on these political economic matters, uh, he frequently referred to Clay, and my, my favorite example of that is in 1832 here in Springfield. Uh, he's running for Congress, uh, and he said uh, uh, the following. My politics are short and sweet like the old woman's dance. I am in favor of a national bank, in favor of the internal improvement system, and a high protective tariff. Uh, he was an uh, ardent disciple of Henry Clay, to whom he was related uh, distantly through his uh, wife, uh, Mary. Uh, uh, Clay was a, a Kentuckian. He'd, although he'd been born in Virginia, he'd moved to Kentucky. Uh, so uh, in 1861, uh, Lincoln described himself, I have always been an old line Henry Clay Whig, and he described Henry Clay as his uh, beau ideal of a statesman. Uh, th his other role model, by the way, in his youth here in uh, Illinois, he, he w at one time told his uh, law partner Herndon that he wanted to be the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois. Well, who is DeWitt Clinton, and why would young Abraham Lincoln want to grow up and be DeWitt Clinton? Uh, well, DeWitt Clinton was the governor of New York who pushed through the Erie Canal which was a very, very important piece of infrastructure indeed uh, because it made New York the most important city in the United States. It wiped out its rivals, uh, Baltimore and uh, Boston. Uh, and just the moment the Erie Canal was created, uh, uh, it, it, it assured that New York would be the uh, 
uh, Empire City, and also that uh, uh, the Midwest uh, was largely fertilized by it because uh, New Englanders, for the most part, and people, uh, including people from upstate New York, followed the Erie Canal, the Great Lakes, and then settled this region, which was settled both from the Great Lakes by New England Yankees and also by uh, Southerners moving north and meeting in the middle and creating very interesting state politics in, in the Midwest uh, as a result of that. Uh, uh, according to Herndon, uh, he explained Lincoln, the young Lincoln's vision of the future Midwest. Quote, every river and stream was to be widened, deepened, and made navigable. Cities were to spring up everywhere. People were to come swarming in by colonies until Illinois was to outstrip all others and herself become the empire state of the Union. So that was Lincoln's model for Illinois as a state legislator and an Illinois congressman. He wanted Illinois to be New York, uh, this great mercantile, industrial metropolis. And, and this goes against the, uh, the popular image of the rustic rural Lincoln. Uh, it, in, in fact, Lincoln wanted to get away from rural life as quickly as possible, and, and he, you know, his whole vision was of factories, uh, canals, roadways, turnpikes, uh, uh, railroads in big cities. So, so I think if he came back and saw you know, modern, developed, uh, urban, uh, industrial uh, uh, Illinois, uh, uh, including uh, the mechanized agriculture, uh, uh, he mused in a, a lecture he gave one time uh, on that he had had ideas for a steam-powered plow. Uh, and he's one of the few presidents who's been an inventor. He actually patented an invention uh, for helping to lift steamboats off of uh, shoals in the Mississippi River when they were stranded. He never, uh, any more than anyone else, actually came up with the steam plow, but, but the idea was that if we mechanized agriculture so one farmer with machines could dispense with a whole lot of labor, that would make agriculture more productive. And this ultimately happened, not as a result of the steam plow, uh, but as a result of the internal combustion engine a few generations later. So now I'm, I'm gonna uh, uh, look at uh, the American system uh, in three different eras. If, if you take this concept of national development based on infrastructure, uh, industry, and finance, and look at them in each of, of what I've described as the three republics. Uh, so with George Washington, the crucial infrastructure was canals. We tend to forget about this uh, because the railroads came along so early in U.S. history. Uh, but when the U.S. was founded, the most advanced, efficient form of transportation was, was still water. Uh, it was much cheaper to go a long distance by water than it was to go a short distance by mule train or by horseback, uh, uh, which was incredibly difficult. Uh, few people know that George Washington, uh, after serving uh, uh, as commander-in-chief of the Continental Line during the American Revolution, uh, when he wasn't being the, the president at the Constitutional Convention and then later the first president of the United States, he spent much of his time as the founder and the major force behind the uh, Potomac Canal Company. Uh, uh, he was, was obsessed with this vision of creating a canal from the Potomac River near his Mount Vernon estate in what later became Washington, D.C., uh, and it would go all the way uh, over the mountains and connect with the Ohio River uh, through tributaries. Uh, and his theory was th this would allow the Washington, D.C., Mount Vernon, Alexandria area to become the commercial center of the future United States. So he wanted it to be the New York of, of America, which is a very interesting uh, uh, vision for a Southern planter because the Southern planter class, for the most part, hated banks and it hated industry and it hated big business. Uh, Washington, like Clay, was sort of a traitor to his class. Uh, he came to dislike slavery. He freed his own slaves after his death. Uh, he tried to die. He, he vowed that he would switch a the agriculture on his farms away from tobacco for export, uh, mostly to Britain, uh, to corn and to domestic products. So he, he it, it, uh, as president, even though he, he pretended in public to be neutral in the debate between his Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, who wanted a rural America of small producers, and his uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, who wanted this modern, urbanizing, industrializing society. Washington personally w was backed Hamilton on every major issue. He had this vision of, of this dynamic, uh, mercantile, uh, uh, capitalist economy uh, that he doesn't get much credit for in, in uh, the history books. Now, tragically, uh, his plan never went anywhere. 
He was never able to raise very much money. Uh, the, what, what became the C&O Canal, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, still exists. Uh, it petered out before it ever reached the uh, Ohio River, and then it became uh, obsolete because of, of uh, the railroads. Uh, so, and the Erie Canal uh, made New York uh, what Washington hoped that uh, Washington, D.C. would be. It's sort of, we think of Washington as this kind of somewhat sleepy political capital, uh, but that Washington's actual vision was is that it was going to be this great center of world capitalism, uh, which may explain why, I say as a Washington, ad adopted Washingtonian, it's so big. I don't know if you've ever visited Washington, but you know, when they laid it out under Washington's guides, it's enormous. He was expecting an enormous city. And it's only in recent uh, years that, that it's actually grown to the proportions that he expected. Uh, the second wave, so, so the, the canals were pre-industrial. Uh, even though the United States was founded in 1776, the same year in which James Watt invented the modern steam engine or perfected it after a long uh, a period of technological development, uh, all the way up until the 1830s, the U.S. still had effectively a pre-industrial economy. It's only in the 1830s that you get a critical mass with enough railroads, you, you get enough uh, steam-powered factories beginning to replace water mills, uh, particularly New England, that you start to get this early industrialization of the United States, which takes place first for social and political reasons uh, in the Northeast and the Midwest. Uh, and I say social and political reasons because the Southern planters, unlike uh, the rare dissidents, including George Washington and Henry Clay, were threatened by industrialization because in, in a, s a society of uh, uh, big flourishing cities with free workers moving in as immigrants from around the world, their own social status uh, as the great landlords who controlled politics and society in their own regions uh, would be undermined. Uh, and so, uh, uh, whereas in, in the, the North, you even saw this in areas like uh, Illinois uh, in free states, uh, when the land was sold to, real, to speculators and then divided up and then sold again, uh, where they expected the planters to buy the land, they would have a few huge plots, which would be plantations. Uh, they wouldn't have no schools. They would have very little public infrastructure because they didn't need it, right? You know, the guy would move up from the deep south and bring slaves uh, and the plantation would be a self-contained economic unit, so you didn't need any kind of civic infrastructure. Uh, where they expected to sell it to lots of small free farmers, uh, then they would put in schools, they would put in lots of roads, they, they would have uh, canals or, or turnpikes or, or uh, later railroads. Uh, so you, you had these two societies grew up uh, in the slave states and in the uh, uh, industrials, uh, what increasingly industrialized free states. Uh, and uh, even though the Civil War was primarily about slavery, that was kind of the backdrop. It, it was a clash of, of two kinds of society, and slavery was part of it, but it wasn't the only part. Uh, with Lincoln, the railroad was for uh, uh, Lincoln what the uh, canal had been for uh, uh, George Washington. Up until 1860, uh, the Southerners vetoed and blocked uh, all bills providing for federal aid uh, for uh, railroads from the east to the Pacific. It didn't benefit the slave uh, plantation economies and they were gonna use their power in Congress just to block it. Uh, I could make topical allusions, but I will not. Uh, once they were out of Congress, once the South seceded and much of the Southern delegation, almost all of it left, uh, then the way was clear finally to do a, a transcontinental railroad. So in 1862, uh, Congress uh, passed legislation uh, creating two, uh, or chartering two companies, the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, uh, to uh, build and operate uh, a, what would become a single transcontinental railroad. Uh, this was done in a massively wasteful, incredibly corrupt manner, uh, which led to the Credit Mobilier scandal and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, indictments of uh, company officials and members of Congress. Uh, and it was a great success uh, in spite of the scandals. Perhaps because of the scandals, they, they, they greased the wheels of commerce. Uh, the American Railroad Network grew between 1860 and 1870 from 29,000 miles to 49,000 miles. That's in one decade. 
uh, beginning with the Lincoln administration. Uh, by 1868, the United States had the highest proportion of railroad mileage to inhabitants on the planet. So that was uh, Lincoln's contribution of, uh, during the Civil War when the Union Pacific or the uh, Central Pacific needed more gunpowder uh, to blast through mountains and you know tunnels through uh, uh, mountains. Lincoln would uh, intervene uh, and order the army to give it to them even though they're fighting a civil war. That's how important uh, he, he saw this uh, transcontinental uh, uh, rail network being. Uh, Finally, FDR and highways. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower usually gets credit for the interstate highway system, and, and he deserves the credit for pushing it through Congress using his uh, prestige as the, the uh, general in World War II. Uh, the bill that finally passed Congress authorizing the modern interstate highway system in the 1950s was called uh, the, uh, I think it's the Defense and Interstate Highway Act because they learned it's easier to get things through Congress if you put defense in, in front of it. Uh, uh, one of the most important agencies in Washington, it, it's uh, DARPA, it's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration, which pioneers robots and, you know, biomedical things and all sorts. It's a great research institution. Uh, and the fact that it's part of the Pentagon has always protected it from scrutiny. And in the 1990s, uh, there was an ex it, the name defense was dropped from it. It briefly became the Advanced Research Projects Administration, ARPA. Congress immediately tried to destroy it and eliminate all its funding. So they stuck a D in front of it, and then the funding came back, and they're, they're still doing quite well. Uh, so, so, but in spite of Eisenhower, uh, it's actually Franklin Roosevelt who was pushing uh, the interstate highway system in, in the 1930s uh, in a series of reports. Uh, and uh, initially, his model was Lincoln. His idea was, it seems kind of wacky now, but since we live in a period of perpetual highway funding crisis, maybe no idea is too crazy about how to fund it. Uh, his idea was that just as the railroads were granted uh, large amounts of land uh, adjacent, which they could then sell to developers to pay the, for the cost of construction, the railroad companies, uh, you would do the same thing. You would have land grants paying for this interstate highway system. And, and Roosevelt's idea never went anywhere. Uh, you know, then the other idea, which in retrospect was probably uh, sounder, you would pay for the interstate highway system through bonds, uh, and then you would repay the bonds through tolls. Uh, but uh, a number of the states by that time in their own state highway systems had been using gasoline taxes to pay for toll-free roads. And so that was the model uh, that ultimately prevailed. It's now in a state of perpetual crisis, uh, as you may know, uh, because American voters do not want the gasoline tax raised even to compensate with inflation. So it's constantly shrinking, and, and we're without a funding base for that. Uh, but the, the point is that we tend to think of these great presidents as living in this world of uh, uh, just abstract philosophy and, and law and social reform. But in fact, the, the, many of the greatest presidents were intimately uh, focused on, on physical real world things like infrastructure. My PowerPoint seems to be dead. Let me uh, try the batteries again. There we go. Manufacturing uh, after infrastructure uh, or internal improvements as part of the American system. Uh, Hamilton, in his famous uh, report on manufacturers during the first Washington administration, uh, recommended what technically is known as import substitution. You use subsidies or tariffs to replace foreign products and you essentially force your own people uh, to buy the, the is like buy America today, that, essentially that policy. Uh, Lincoln followed that Although uh, by Lincoln's time, <coughs> uh, tariffs were favored over, over uh, subsidies. Uh, Lincoln was an ardent protectionist, as were most of the Whigs uh, and the Republicans in the Northeast and the Midwest when they were trying to foster these uh, new American industries to compete with the established uh, British industries. Uh, uh, Lincoln, in fact, uh, would make the anglophobic argument uh, sometimes against uh, uh, the British. He said uh, one time uh, uh, in one of his uh, races here in uh, Britain, I mean, I mean in uh, uh, Illinois, those whose pride, whose abundance of means prompt them to spurn the manufacturers of their own country 
and to strut in British cloaks and coats and pantaloons may have to pay a few cents more on the yard for the cloth that makes them. A terrible evil, surely, to the Illinois farmer who never wore nor never expects to wear a single yard of British goods in his life. Uh, as a legislator, uh, Lincoln would wear only locally made clothes in, on, in some cases, and his model for that was George Washington, who for his inauguration wore only homespun in a kind of a Buy American uh, uh, campaign. Uh, so all modern academic economists will tell you that uh, countries that engage in protectionism inevitably suffer and fail. Uh, unfortunately, all of the leading industrial countries in the world, uh, including Germany and, and Britain and the United States, all went through a protectionist phase. That doesn't mean you want to keep it forever. Uh, but uh, no major industrial capitalist country has ever developed, I can say that categorically, no major industrial, and maybe some small ones, uh, without favoring its own industries at an early stage of development. Now, according to this theory, which Hamilton was the first to set forth, and uh, which uh, Clay and Lincoln and the others followed, uh, protectionism is like training wheels. Once your native industries have developed so that they're competitive, at that point you should re remove the training wheels. Now, this is easier said than done, both in the United States in the early 1900s and in modern China, which has pursued a different kind of currency-based protectionism to disadvantage uh, uh, other countries like the US and help out its own manufacturers, because you've now created powerful manufacturing interests with political influence, uh, even in a non-democracy like China. So there tends to be resistance to the second phase of opening up. Uh, but that, that's what this uh, infant industry protection theory calls for. Uh, uh, and uh, among the people who understood this was uh, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, one of Lincoln's successors. Uh, he pointed out that as president, President Grant pointed out that Britain had industrialized behind a wall of protective tariffs, turning to free trade only when its manufactured exports were superior to those of other countries. And uh, quoting President Grant, he said, after two centuries, England found it convenient to adopt free trade because it thinks that protection can no longer offer it anything. Very well, gentlemen. My knowledge of our country leads me to believe that within 200 years, when America has gotten out of protection all that it can offer, it too will adopt free trade. Uh, well, in fact, it didn't take 200 years. Uh, already by 1900, William McKinley, who had been responsible for a high tariff, uh, uh, the, the McKinley tariff, uh, in his last speech he gave, uh, uh, at, at, uh, before he was assassinated, he called for the U.S. to liberalize its trade policy on the grounds that now, since America was the world's leading industrial nation, it had more to gain from trade with other countries than it did from continuing to protect its industries, which no longer needed protection. And so there was a gradual shift in elite opinion uh, that culminated uh, in the 1940s and after World War II, when the United States, having used protection successfully to become the dominant industrial power, now told everyone else they had to stop protecting their markets and start buying American exports. Uh, uh, and that period lasted up until the 1970s when uh, Germany and Japan uh, uh, recovered uh, and U.S. industry began facing real competition again and then this consensus on free trade versus uh, protection frayed. Uh, but, but there is kind of a long-term uh, story there. Finally, the third leg of Clay's American system was finance. Uh, uh, it, to which Alexander Hamilton's uh, major contribution was the first bank of the United States, uh, which was destroyed in uh, 1811 by Jeffersonians in Congress, who just hated banks in general, but particularly big, big, uh, this was, was uh, based in Philadelphia. It was, a, it was everything that Jeffersonians hate, right? First, it was big. Jeffersonians don't like anything big. Uh, second, it was a bank, and, and they're suspicious of money and, and of, of uh, uh, investors as a kind of parasitic class on the farmer and, and the, the uh, honest uh, uh, manufacturer. It was a public-private partnership. That is, some of the stock was owned by the government, some of it was owned by private investors, including uh, foreign investors. So there was a kind of xenophobic element. Uh, so with, with, with great to-do, the Jeffersonians wiped out this evil bank, this, this un-American institution. Uh, and then uh, declared war on Britain, the War of 1812, uh, and just found themselves in, in a tremendous uh, fiscal crisis uh, because they couldn't raise the funds to do this. And, and uh, they had to turn to private financiers uh, in, uh, to do this. I, I tell the story at greater length uh, 
uh, in, in here, including John Jacob Astor bailed out the federal government, along with a few other uh, uh, rich uh, European immigrant financiers in the United States, much to the chagrin of the uh, Jeffersonians, who didn't like bankers, and they particularly didn't like immigrant European bankers. Uh, but so the, the Jeffersonians then decided, well, maybe we actually do need some kind of a central bank. So they created, uh, they chartered a new second bank in the United States, which Andrew Jackson, uh, over Henry Clay's uh, objections, then abolished in the 1830s, plunging the U.S. back into uh, uh, financial chaos, which brings us to Abraham Lincoln and national banking. Uh, when Lincoln assumed power, there was no national currency. This seems odd nowadays. Uh, uh, the only currency was issued by individual banks, and it had to be backed up in, in gold or, or uh, silver. Uh, but so, you know, it, I mean, imagine if you had Bank of America money and if you had, you know, uh, Citibank money and, and all of that, but there, there, was no, there were no dollar bills, right? Uh, so one of the first things that the Lincoln Republicans did when the Southern opposition was out of Congress uh, was to try to kill the, 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 the current, the, all this chaos of currencies and create a uniform national currency. And the way they did that in a couple of ways, uh, first through taxing uh, the currency of state chartered banks. Uh, they just put a 10% tax on it, uh, and then that drove it out of existence fairly quickly. And that, thus, we have a national currency today. Uh, then the, the second way, to, they hoped to create a system of purely federally chartered banks. Uh, so if, if you ever wondered, you know, why the town has first bank of something and then like first national bank, that, that it actually is a technical difference uh, between banks chartered by the federal government, which have to obey certain regulations, and, and banks chartered by the states. Now, uh, Lincoln's uh, allies hoped that uh, the federal charters of banks would get rid of state banks, and we would have a purely federal uh, system of, of federally chartered banks. That did not, in fact, happen, and to this day, we have a dual system, which is unique in the industrial world, of federally chartered banks and state chartered banks. And the, ch the state chartered banks survived because the state legislatures figured out that in return for donations, uh, they could lower the standards for the state banks to below what the federal standards were, right? Uh, and create a kind of a race to the bottom. And so state banks, after looking like they'd go extinct uh, for a while in the 1860s, uh, actually made a comeback. Uh, and to this day, you have this uh, dual system, which makes it very difficult uh, to regulate the, the uh, national system. Uh, the Lincoln Republicans and their allies did not try to create a new bank of the United States or, or a new central bank. That actually came uh, in the uh, Wilson administration with the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, the, a modern uh, European style uh, central bank. The concession to the Je Jeffersonians was that the Federal Reserve would be a system of regional banks on the theory that at least that way the New York bankers would not control all of the decisions of the St. Louis Fed or the San Francisco Fed or whatever, but essentially the Federal Reserve can be seen as the third bank of the United States. Uh, I, I put uh, Roosevelt up here because something else that uh, occurred, although it wasn't just in the New Deal, it was also in the, in the decades previous, the United States came up with a system of public banks. We don't think of them necessarily as banks, but, it, but effectively they are. Uh, uh, you had the uh, uh, Ginnie Mae and its offspring later on, uh, which became notorious as Fannie Mae and, and uh, Freddie Mac, uh, uh, to create a secondary market for uh, home mortgages. Uh, you had the farm uh, credit system, which is very important in agricultural states like Illinois, uh, based on early 20th century German models uh, in which was a state-backed system of credit for the uh, agricultural sector. Uh, so, so in a way you can see uh, the New Deal as, as building on, on this element of uh, Clay's American system in, in new circumstances of the 20th century. So, uh, you know, as I say, a lot of these debates come and go. Uh, they're perennial, the details change, uh, but the basic clashes of values and vision uh, are, are often the same. Uh, and I just want to conclude by saying that uh, uh, the debates about the national debt are nothing new, uh, particularly after a crisis uh, like the Great Recession or, or the Civil War. Uh, you had a, a Mary Lincoln uh, was asked after the assassination of uh, President Lincoln uh, what, what he might have done if he had lived, and she said, uh, 
he used to say that he wanted to take the family to Europe. He'd never been to Europe. And then after they toured Europe, uh, they would go to California, uh, where the U.S. Army would be uh, digging out gold to pay down the national debt, uh, a proposal which is not part of today's Washington debate, but, but uh, perhaps it should be considered. Thank you.